to be celebrated. You know, this international day doesn't inspire me so much. I don't know what happened. Why? Of the Hong San Suu Kyi. Undoubtedly the most famous icon for the struggle of democracy in today's embattled world. To have spent 15 years of the last 21 years in some form of detention and yet not let bitterness or rancor invade one's consciousness speaks of a unique transcendence of the spirit. Today we celebrate not only the undaunted spirit and courage but the rare sensibility that blends the empathy of non-violence with the tempered steel of resolve and dedicated conviction to the cause of freedom. We celebrate Aung San Suu Kyi for being the symbol of strength and moral leadership that women can indeed provide in today's world. We feel empowered by her struggle for democracy and human rights in Burma, her perseverance, faith, empathy of non-violence, with the tempered steel of resolve and dedicated conviction to the cause of freedom. We celebrate Aung San Suu Kyi for being the symbol of strength and moral leadership that women can indeed provide in today's world. We feel empowered by her struggle for democracy and human rights in Burma, her perseverance, faith. Vaklav Havel once said, he had nominated Aung San Suu Kyi for the Nobel Prize and he said this of her, by dedicating her life to the fight for human rights and democracy in Burma, Suu Kyi is not only speaking out for justice in her own country, but also for all those who want to be free to choose their own destiny. Whether the cry for freedom comes from Central Europe, from Russia, Africa or Asia, it has a common sound. All people must be treated with dignity. All people need hope. The enduring power of individuals principle of nonviolence is well known. But it must also resonate with us deeply today. Icons like Suu Kyi teach us that freedom is the core of democracy. They simultaneously hold out the fleeting hope that we can indeed make our own history even today and somehow we can attempt to dislodge the fortresses of illegitimate power. As her late husband Michael Aris pointed out, she always insisted and at all times that the movement should be based on a non-violent struggle with human rights as the primary object. She spoke to the common people of her country in a way that they had not been spoken to before for so long, and she, she made every individual feel worthy of love with human rights as the primary object. She spoke to the common people of her country in a way that they had not been spoken to before for so long, and she, she made every individual feel worthy of love and respect. The Dalai Lama himself, in a congratulatory note, after she received the Nobel Peace Prize in 91 wrote, as a Tibetan, I can perhaps understand the courage and determination of Aung San Suu Kyi and the Burmese people more than others. I therefore wish and pray for her early release and for the restoration of freedom and democracy in Burma. Nearly two decades later, the Burma into which she is released is a vastly different country from the, the place she last properly encountered in 2003. It is no longer a geopolitical backwater. The strategic interests of two emerging giants in Asia, China and India, close in onto that space. National policies and above all, issues of national security and expediency dictate choices rather than those exhorted by international mandates or even ethics and international morality. Burma itself internally confronts fissures around diverse ethnicities in its borderlands. All these factors might cohere to make the transition of Aung San Suu Kyi from political prisoner to the locus of 
political, of national reconciliation and democratic resurgence somewhat fraught and not entirely seamless. But those are larger political and geostrategic issues on which I am not competent to comment. Suffice it to say that Suu Kyi has always stood for and articulated an aspect, an important aspect of human security, namely the freedom from fear. It has in many ways provided the leitmotiv of her work and her striving. She melds in her work the best in the Western liberal tradition as well as her profoundly Buddhist belief. In her own words, it is not power that corrupts, but fear. Fear of losing power corrupts those who wield it, and fear of the scourge of power corrupts those who are subject to it. In an open letter to the UN Commission on Human Rights, Suu Kyi wrote, and I quote, those who believe in the sanctity of human rights do not reject the concept of law and order, but they would wish to ensure that the law is not just the will of the dominant faction and that order is not simply the wire flex of an all-pervading fear. The majority of the people in Burma desire a state which preserves dharma and abhaya, righteousness and absence of fear. In the face of the most desolate and devastating personal choices and challenges and adversity, including her decision not to leave Burma to be with her dying husband, Suu Kyi's astonishing serenity has been unmatched. The reservoir of strength so necessary for processes of reconciliation emanate from her naturally, beyond the clangor of rhetoric and the shrillness of populism. On her release, she exhorted her NLD supporters to show restraint, not encourage hype, and yet signaled that she would not settle for a delusion of her final goals or her political sights. The, at the same time, the NLD itself is not the same unified group it once used to be. After all, one faction, the USDP, did contest the recent elections in Burma, despite Suu Kyi's call for total boycott and won 16 out of the 163 seats that it contested. But nearly two decades of detention have not served to break Aung San Suu Kyi's will. It has not embittered or shaken her resolve. It has not succeeded in ruffling her unbelievable equanimity and composure. It is as if her search for justice, seeped in nonviolence, strives for that finer balance, and I quote, the balance between the need to acknowledge and the need to transcend what has been acknowledged, between the requirement of the social order and the necessity of human dignity, between the continuity of institutions and the urgency of transformation, between the anger of resistance and the compassion without which resistance only generates into further oppression. As a young undergraduate at Lady Sri Ram College, Sue, as she was affectionately called by her peers, wrote a very poignant story in 1963. It was published in the college magazine and was called Like a Bird in the Woods. It was to reflect astonishingly prescient parallels to the journey that her own life would later take. It told the story of a young boy's fascination with a freedom fighter, Ong Lin, of the Burmese resistance against the Japanese invasion, who had, as a fugitive, taken shelter and refuge in the boy's home, and about the relationship that developed between Ong Lin and the members of the family, especially the little boy and his grandfather. Ong Lin finally goes back to the inferno of war and is killed fighting valiantly in battle. The family is shattered by the news and overcome by the feeling that all that they had done to protect him finally was of no avail and came to no end. 
The grandfather's sagacity towards the end of the story is the author's final statement and reflects her philosophy. Son, grandpa said, there are some things men cannot do, but we must try our best. If Ong Ling had died under Japanese torture, his soul would have grieved. But dying in battle was something I'm sure he didn't mind so much. He was, after all, he was, said Grandpa, like a, f like a bird in the woods. Sue, in her own story, displayed an uncanny clairvoyance of how events were to later unfold. What does she represent then? The friendship and loyalty of the family, the sagacity and compassion of the, of the grandfather, the fearless sacrifice of Ong Lin, or the quest and sense of wonder about the unfolding life of the little boy. Ong San Suu Kyi is, of all, is all of these faces of her beloved Burmese people. Or is she? I think she is a different bird in the woods. A bird whose wings will fly in freedom. A bird who will bring life back to the woods and make it an enchanted space. The world waits in anticipation for the day when the Dur Burmese people will once again carry flowers and candle to the Shwedagon Pagoda in celebration of their true freedom. Thank you very much, Mother. I now invite uh, Mr. Sharad Joshi, founder of Farmers Movement Shetkari Sangatna and former MP. MP